Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. Purple Daily, presented by Surly Brewing Company. The wide receiver Jalen Rager <laughs> has been traded away from the Eagles to the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Schultz has been told, once again, this is Jordo. This is Schultz, who we love. Love, love, love Jordo. Love Jordo. He's told that the comp for Philly is as follows. A seventh round pick in 2023, a conditional 2024 fifth round pick that could become a fourth rounder if certain statistical marks are met. So if Jalen Rager goes on to be a guy for the Vikings, that'll become a fourth rounder two years from now. And if whatever rounder next year, this seems like a good play. Rager didn't want to be there, right? I think that was the thing. He yeah. wasn't getting as much playing time. Wow. Thank you to Pat McAfee for just explaining everything we're about to talk about in this episode of Purple Daily. Daily Vikings Entertainment. We just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die. It's been 60 years, guys. Let's get a move on here. Uh, the show is presented by our friends at Surly Brewing Company and TCL. No matter what you watch, TCL has award-winning TVs for any budget, any space, all with stunning picture quality. And TCL makes more than just TVs. They offer mobile products, audio devices, home appliances. TCL bring you joy and simplicity through innovative technology. A quick mention here that we are just a little over a week away from the first regular season post-game Vikings vent line. If you are new to the Purple Daily family of podcasts, if you are new to this community, uh, you are about to embark on the most fan-friendly, interactive, biggest, baddest, best post-game show on the planet, only on the Purple Daily YouTube channel. Every single time the Vikings play a game, we are waiting and lurking on the Purple Daily YouTube channel to turn the show over to you guys. We bring fans into the show for an hour or two after the game. Uh, so be sure to check out Vikings Vent Line. Make sure you're subscribed to the Purple Daily YouTube channel so that you get that alert that says, hey, these three clowns are live and they're about to throw it over to a bunch of drunk fans who are mad or happy, depending on what happened in the game. So uh, Vikings Vent Line. Very intelligent drunk fans, though. Make that 100% very clear. Intel yeah, very intelligent. The most intelligent drunk, sometimes angry fans you're going to find. Uh, so McAfee laid it out there off the top of the show here. The Vikings, I mean, Quasey has been, go back to the draft even, the amount of trades this guy has made in the first nine months on the job, and the yep. latest being uh, Jalen Rager, who there is that famous clip of the Vikings during the, the COVID draft. They're all on Zoom, and they're all, right, that was the 2020 draft. They're all just, like, right. in their basements and stuff, and they're snickering and laughing about the Eagles taking Jalen Rager yeah. right before they were about to pick Justin Jefferson, uh, and now maybe the Vikings can, maybe they can reclaim some of Jalen Rager's potential and career. Uh, they give up the 2023 seventh and a conditional fourth in 2024, and the casualty on the roster is Emir Smith Marset was waived. I have a bunch of thoughts on this, but let's just throw it out there, Judd. Uh, your your initial impressions digesting this trade. Well. Starting with the trade, which uh, we didn't see the Amir smith Marset move for a while. We just saw the trade. Uh, there are some people that thought, thought, man, two draft picks. The Vikings are giving up a lot. Oh, boy. Here's my thought process there. And it's become very clear. If you want them, you can get draft picks back. So, like, uh, first-round picks are hard to get. Second-round picks are harder are, are hard to get. After that, if you trade picks, you can get, if you want to recoup those picks, you can find a way to get those picks back. So, I am not going to sweat the conditional fourth-round pick, uh, which, as McAfee explained, drops down if, he, if uh, Rager does not meet some statistical um, milestones. But I think this move was made for a couple of reasons and one I one I like and I'm not saying this is perfection because if you go back to the Tampa Bay Philadelphia playoff game there were some muffs here uh Rager has experience returning punts and kicks and punts is the most important they didn't have anyone on their roster who I consider to be a sufficient punt return guy mm -hmm. which you know what you can be like well I mean come on it's special teams it's punt it's punt returns but uh again if you screw up that job on September 11th against the Packers and, and you have what football people call sudden change. That's football death. <laughs> sudden change is football sudden death. Sudden change, dude. Football. Sudden change deserves the football. If time. you muff a punt against the Packers, they recover at, you know, at, at, at your 19, that is absolute death. So uh, in that vein, I, I like the trade. Now, I am well aware of the fact that there have been times Rager has had issues with muffs as well. So I'm hoping that that gets cleared up. 
Uh, and as far as the receiver aspect of this goes, I think it's worth a gamble. Why not? Uh, the Vikings have done this uh, going back to, uh, oh man, going back to Childress, going back to Jerry Burr. You know, you, you take a flyer on a, a guy and if, if it works... Chris Carter being the best example. Oh my God, you you have hit. Uh, if it doesn't work, numerous guys. Um, I believe the last receiver that came from Philadelphia with experience was Todd Pinkston. Didn't work. Wow, that's a name. Okay, it, it didn't work. But my point being is Hank Basket. Well, didn't Hank Basket come over too? I thought Hank. Uh, yeah, Hank Basket was that's before Pinkston in 2000. I think Hank Basket was might have been on Childress's original team. Yeah. Um, and, he was and more then, famous for being on that reality show with uh, Kendra yeah. Wilkinson than he uh -huh. was. That's right. Uh huh. Yes. I, uh, Great show. Yeah, yeah. He played. I think he played here in 06. I think Pinkston was like 07 or 08 and got a cup of coffee and uh, was just awful. But anyway. I like the gamble here. I like the fact that they clearly are trying to, and we'll find out if it's successful, address the punt return job. And I don't think the compensation is anything that should keep people up at night. I think that's the one where we get far too hung up on. You gave up a fifth round pick, and it's because we've been conditioned by Rick to yeah. be like, well, you got to have eight fifth round picks or you're screwed. No, you're not. <laughs> You got to do. You got to have seven third and yeah. fourth round picks so that those players can be cut eighteen months later before their second season. That's what you really need in the NFL. Exactly. So yeah, I've been thinking about. So there, there was this trade, and then you know, and we reacted to the Ross Blacklock trade, saying goodbye to Armand Watts, and then bring in Ross Blacklock. And there might be another shoe to drop here too. Still, at some point, could they bring in Indama Kung Su after Week One on a non guaranteed contract? So there's other things that could still happen here, but. I've been just trying to put myself in Quasi's brain and, and shoes, and his brain is much more vast and, uh, and deep with knowledge than mine is. I don't know how big his shoes are, but, you know, what is, what is he doing here? Why is he making some of these moves? And I think back to his introductory press conference and, and some of the subsequent media appearances, even the USA Today sit-down that kind of kind of scared him into not talking to the media much anymore. And one of the big themes when he talks, he, he talks like a, like a professional gambler does. And I can relate to this as a guy that played poker for a number of years. He looks at players and he looks at draft picks and any potential move that you would make on the NFL chessboard as a bet, a calculated risk that you would take. And you're trying to tilt the odds in your favor as an organization with every single bet that you place. And so he might look at the Vikings roster and say, okay, um, you know, Kirk Cousins is a very safe bet because you know exactly what you're going to get for the most part. Now, maybe there's some risk involved in not going for a higher upside quarterback, but you know, like Kirk Cousins is one of the safest bets in the NFL. You know, you know that you're going to compete for a 500 record at worst, and you know that he's going to give you a good, solid performance, great first read quarterback, etc. Mm -hmm. But then you might take a flyer on. You know, in the draft, there might be a third or fourth round player or even like a first or second round player that's highly athletic, tests off the charts, but the productivity wasn't there in college. And so you're gambling that you can mold him into something that he wasn't in college. Right. So there's all these levels of bets in general. First and second round picks, I think, in the mind and the world of Quasi, very analytical, looking to maximize their potential upside with all these bets. Right. First and second round draft picks have higher ceilings largely than later round guys do. And if you have a chance to buy low on an asset that within the last two years was once very highly touted, tested off the charts, a lot of teams thought that, that both Jalen Rager and Ross Blacklock, who was the 40th overall pick in 2020, I think they both came out in the same year from TCU, right? So they, both, they were both, um, they were like the two best players on TCU basically. And, and the Vikings with Quasi are essentially saying, not that long ago, these two guys were first and second round talents who tested off the charts. We liked them maybe in Cleveland when we were scouting. And all we have to do is boot a fifth round pick, Amir Smith-Marset, off the roster. And people love Amir Smith-Marset, but maybe Quasi thinks, hey, he's, yeah, he, wasn't, he doesn't have the ceiling of a Jalen Rager. Yep. He's only caught five passes in the NFL at this point, right? Yep. And Armand Watts, good solid player, but he's like you know he's like a fifth or a sixth round pick for a reason. Um, even the right guard decision, right? Well, listen, the second round pick at Ingram might not be as good as maybe Chris Reed right now, but he played well in practice and he has a much higher ceiling and upside 
than the veteran sort of journeyman that you would be uh, putting in in his place. So mm-hmm. I think what they're doing is they're saying we're buying low on stocks that were very, very promising two years ago. More Jalen Rager than Ross Blacklock, but the concept is the same. And we're saying goodbye to a couple of guys that we like, but you know there was, there's a reason why those guys were fifth and sixth round picks. So the question then is, are the Vikings arrogantly trying to reclaim these players? Are they are they getting out over their skis with reclamation projects here saying, oh my gosh, we can totally turn Jalen Rager into what he was supposed to be right. and Ross Blacklock into what he was supposed to be? Or are they wisely buying low on? Are, are they are they are they arrogant in that thinking? Or are they are they wise and ahead of the curve with that thinking? Because it's kind of a fine line, you know, based on what what the results may be. Right. It's um, it's actually a combination, in my opinion, of both things. So and and if you say, well, how do you know that, Judd? There's no way. I am told these are all great moves. I everywhere else I go, I'm told this is fantastic. Here's how I know. Look at the twins. This is the twins. Like, this is the thinking. This is the thinking in sports now. So it's not just a baseball. Analytics and baseball, it's ruining the sport. Dylan Bunn, um, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is this is the thinking now that's prevailing throughout more and more sports. And so there are things about this move that I like. The Blacklock move needs to have a corresponding move. I can I could go to Quasi right now and say, dude, you need a corresponding move. And if you've got one, bravo, congratulations. If if you really think, oh my goodness, a second round pick fell, and I can take him, and I and 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 again, the one thing I will agree with is he's trading draft picks. If you really want him back, you can recoup him. So so like that's the one thing I am never going to be hung hung up on a conditional fourth round pick. You must be an idiot. But Blacklock needs a corresponding move. So like if you are like, well, we can fix him and he can start. I'm going to tell you right now, that's a gamble going too far. Uh, Rager, because of where he is on the depth chart. I think is a good, solid gamble. And, I and you know, clearly what Kwesi is doing 1,000% is he is playing the Vikings roster as stocks. Yes. Like, that, that's his background. That's who he is. And, and he was hired with this. This was the goal. So, so like, it can't be, uh, I, you know, I'm very shocked by how he's uh, uh, um, doing things now. This is exactly how he was brought on board to do things. Rager I like because of where he fits in on the depth chart. And if it works, the upside is huge. If it doesn't work, unless he fumbles, punts three times against the Packers, I think you're fine. Um, Blacklock accelerates people and himself up a, up a depth chart that I don't like. But if there is an endemic and Sue move behind it, it's like, okay, now that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I, but I mean, these are all, these are all very interesting to me. Uh, uh, gambles on what would be the stock market of the Vikings roster. I think yep. that's the way to perceive this. And and there are things I agree with. There are things I don't. And that's where the Amir Smith-Marset thing, I didn't like, and here's why. And and there's this, I don't know if you guys saw, saw this, but Twitter instantly like took sides i hate this move because of smith marset or Wait, twitter was polarizingly taking well, sides on an issue but i feel like we need to explain this to twitter like i feel like there's there's a lack of i feel like there's a major lack of understanding about roster construction okay nobody is saying amir smith marset is going to be a great player like nobody and I know a lot of pe- a lot of folks who two weeks ago swore by him. Oh, this guy's going to be great. By yesterday, had turned and, and had been like, "Ah, oh, he sucks. Who cares?" But <laughs> I this still is all- stand for Amir Smith Marcel. That what, one that one stung a little bit yesterday. But what Quasi is doing is is the art of roster construction. So this is never about Amir Smith Marcet's going to be in Canton one day. I have no clue. Probably not. But what it is about is when you look at your your um to to equate it to the stock market roster portfolio okay mm-hmm. wow your roster portfolio exists right this now a, this is how my brain thing i love that you're doing this because this, this is, is exactly incredible. how my brain thinks so yeah, i was going great. through this yesterday when he when they made this move <laughs> and again it's not this reactive amir smith marcet was fantastic and you guys are idiots it's this and this is where the stock market game falls a little bit short in sports and where the common sense coach comes in 
Ole Udo survived yesterday. He survived yesterday because of an assumption about his size and talents. But if you think it all the way through, are you telling me this? For several reasons, if I were to cut, and by the way, I have kept right now three backup tackles, so I am not hurting for depth. If I were to cut Ole Udo yesterday, and he was an awful guard, he's back at tackle last year, what it, what are better odds getting Ole Udo through the waiver process today if I want him back, or Amir Smith Marset? And then the okay. final and then the final step I will give you is this: Who do I want claimed? Because if it, because <laughs> you're saying if, you'd like you'd like the Packers to claim Ole Udo and well, what I'm saying is a game against you. What I'm saying <laughs> is, and again, this goes back to the whole draft pick thing, and it, it's all gambles. Like it's just all gambling, which is fun. Uh, but uh, I don't. But to Declan's point from like two weeks ago, I don't necessarily want Amir Smith Marset on the Packers roster because I know that their quarterback can actually make him better, and more importantly, he's going to have knowledge of things that on September 11th I don't want shared. Uh, so who who claimed him by the way? He, he's he is going he's, to be he's still he's claimed today probably right? claimed today yes I think the deadline to claim him today is going to be like 11 a.m. or something like okay. that. okay so all right let, let um so you're essentially saying all right guys you didn't have to swap receiver for receiver here you could have you could have just kept an extra receiver and right, and gone from 10 offensive linemen down to nine and then this gets into the there's there's so many more things here of like philosophically how many offensive linemen do they think they need depth wise to make it through the first part of the season or whatever they they might view a a guy who can play potentially three or four different spots on the offensive line who is that ta- I mean Ole Udo is in terms of like athletic ability and ability to to be that large and play guard and tackle he does have unique talents those talents didn't translate to productivity <laughs> at right guard last season. But they might, what they might be saying is, okay, neither Ole Udo or Emir Smith Marset are going to be Pro Bowl caliber players at any point. Which one of those guys can help fill a need in a pinch in the first half of the season? Well, we would we would put Ole Udo into a game as a you know backup offensive lineman in the case of injury, and we would you know we would expect that he can at least hold his own. Emir Smith Marset might have to climb over three or four other guys just to get a route run on the field. And I, and I, I stand for Amir Smith Marset. I do think he's going to be a, a productive wide receiver in the NFL, but he kind of proved that he can't return punts reliably. And that was one of the big holes on this roster, right? Like I think if, I think if he were to have shown a little bit more reliability as a punt returner, I don't know that they make this trade. Maybe they make the trade from the stock portfolio angle that you're talking about. And right. that's kind of how my brain is thinking about this is what's so fascinating to me is that if you were to build an NFL roster of of stocks, right, of each player is a stock, from a 30,000-foot perspective, you'd want as many f- former first and second round picks. I know Tom Brady was a sixth round pick. I know Tony Romo was undrafted. I know Stefan Diggs was a fifth round pick. I'm And Daniil Hunter was like, a, what, a third round pick. So I am not saying that you can't find gems later in the draft. You can, and the Vikings have. But if you look over the years, there's a much better chance of first and second round talents becoming starting caliber players, Pro Bowl caliber players. And that is the way that Quasey is thinking about this. He is saying, and I actually just pulled up, there's a great article from uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia, just an angry Eagles writer that went back sometime. Let me see, what was the date on this? Uh, after the season was over, and they're just pissed about Jalen Rager for the second straight year, and you know he's dropping puns. He's and by the way, like he's not a great punt returner. Yeah, you know he ranked like 17th in yards per return. He's not. You can not do like, it, but he's yeah. not great at it. He muffed two against the Bucks and lost one, and it was it was absolutely awful. Yeah, so it, it's not like you're all right. Well, he's reliable at catching the. He's not, but. <laughs> Um, but some of these write-ups, so the, the, the point of this article was, boy, look at all the positive things the draft experts were saying about this guy two years ago, and now look at him. And, uh, and so that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, boy, look at all the things that people were saying about this guy less than two years ago, or two years ago. Not that long ago, right? He's only 23 years old. 
It's not like Jalen Rager's 28. He's 23 years old. NFL Draft Network said, quote, Jalen Rager is one of the most dynamic receiving prospects in the 2020 NFL Draft. His skill set best fits when projecting forward into a vertical passing offense as a Z receiver. Wow. Okay. Football. Where he can defeat press coverage, attack down the field, and use his speed to make defenses pay the consequences. Um, our guy, Eric Eager, our friend of the show and vice president of, of research at Pro Football Focus, said, Rager is one of the more interesting prospects in the entire draft. In fact, our athleticism metric at PFF, which measures various combine metrics using uh, different analysis and forecasts, that metric, the athleticism metric, had Jalen Rager projected as the best player let's see here uh, they've they've never given a receiver a better grade than it gave Jalen Rager now of course the commentator here says maybe PFF needs to change its formula for the athleticism grade because you know they're bitter um and again Eric isn't saying which means he's going to be this amazing play like they're saying he's got all the ingredients to be an amazing player it hasn't come together yet this is two years ago and there's a bunch of other ones here. There's you know, Daniel Jeremiah is quoted in here, and you know Matt Miller from from Bleacher Report. So so that is what Quasey's looking. He's saying, boy, not that long ago, this dude was one of the 20 or 25 best prospects in the entire draft class. Let's let's kick a seventh round pick over to these guys and see what we can do. Can you find his drops so far? Because I I think I think mm-hmm. that's been the problem. And and again, that's the scary thing in this town. That was a problem in college too for him. Great athletic ability. Who? Where? Where does this sound familiar? Great athletic ability, but can't catch the football consistently. Troy Williams. Troy Williams. Yeah. He's yeah. catching Troy Williams. So. Yeah, great speed, but can't catch the football consistently. And I don't yeah. know that you could. The problem with that one is I don't know you can fix that one. Well, you could send him to a Nike camp, get him some. Uh, oh, God, stop. Some, some Nike in Oregon. Isn't that what they did? Yes, the vision, the Nike vision. Oh, God, did I buy into that story. That's one of those situations <laughs> in retrospect. God, where, you know what? I get you might want to just go to the camp, do it, don't tell anyone that you went, and hope that the results are better. Because the problem is if you tell everyone, hey, I went and got my vision's better, I went to a, I went to a Nike camp, it's great. Yeah. It's like, well, we're going to expect that you're good at football now. Every Sunday, I literally put butter on my hands, but you guys <laughs> should see how well I can see everything now. Oh, my gosh. Um, all right, on wide receivers here last year, I'm just going to sort by drop percentage. Okay. Um. Yeah, he <laughs> he had one of the highest. He had an 11% drop rate, which is not very good. Darius Slayton had a 20% drop rate. Van Jefferson had a 15% drop rate. Really? Debo Samuel had a 13.5% drop rate, but uh, he also had a ton of productivity. If if Jalen Rager could become some version of like Debo Samuel, yes, I would we, I would I would live with the drop rate. Okay yes, you that. would. AJ Brown had a pretty high drop rate. Uh, but Jay, so Jalen Rager had uh, yeah an eleven percent drop rate last year. Okay, so yeah. And then let's see here. I just want to see the now that I'm on the PFF page. Yeah, PFF had him. Oof, <laughs> a fifty six point three grade. Which, if you're wondering, so fifty six point three out of a hundred. Justin Jefferson was ninety point one out of a hundred. Mm-hmm. So, I think the eye test would validate that. I still get it. Watch though. those two guys play. I get the gamble. I do too. What um to what extent do you guys just to put a bow on this here? To what extent do you guys feel like the Vikings will regret moving on from Emir Smith Marset? Eh, I mean not like on a one to ten scale, ten being the biggest amount of regret, one being one like a like a three, like a three. And also to our point of finding wide receivers, like you can just you can find these guys now. That does not discredit what Justin Jefferson is as a twenty first overall pick and a generational talent. But it, we're figuring out you can find wide receivers. So if Amir Smith Marset, by the way, also goes to the Packers or Bears and plays well, you know, like not, I'm not saying Justin Jefferson level, but catches 50 balls per season and is flirting with 600, 700 yards, I'm not going to lose sleep over that. Like I, I'm really not, even if the Vikings are playing him two times a year. And if Jalen Rager turns out to be something a little bit more than what he was in Philadelphia, I think it's all, it, it's all a good thing. I'd put it at about a, a two. Um, the issue is this, it, it largely is going to depend, when we do look back at this in hindsight, it's largely going to depend on who ISM's quarterback is. So it, it, if he goes to a place where he gets a quarterback, you know what, he could be he could be good, who, who knows. If he goes to the Bears, 
you know, and gets fields, I think it's going to be nothing. But the point, again, being I would like to know that my grand takeaway is not Amir Smith-Marset. My grand takeaway is the process at which they're doing things and how they consider who they're going to try to sneak through right now, the waiver process. So, like, this was never about just one player. Oh, my God, you just, you know, you you just cut Chris Carter. Mm-hmm. My, my whole thing, to, to get back to our discussion, Phil, is the game that's being played, the, the stock market game that's being played and the stocks that you decide to move on from uh, and, and why, which is why I am far more forgiving of mid to late round draft picks. Like, I'm just not hung up on them like this is go- going to be. Because, Phil, you're exactly right. Like, the 2021 draft, 7 of 11 guys are gone. Yeah. Like, like that draft, that that Jets trade now, the, the Derisaw Jets trade is a swap of 14 for 23 straight up. Because the Vikings' added incentive was... Two third round picks. Mm-hmm. Kellen Mann was one, and I believe Wyatt Davis was the other one. Yeah. So the draft pick thing to me becomes much more difficult to assess and get hung up on unless you just get ripped off royally. Um, but yeah, I was more interested in what the Vikings process was in who they decided to put through the waiver process when they did uh, make the trade of Philadelphia. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I think um, it's probably you, so. You guys have it like at a two or a three in terms of will you regret it? I, I, I think it's probably like a four. I, I, I think he's going to be a productive like number three wide receiver. I think he's. I, I thought they were higher on him than to just jettison him like this. So, so it's I, it's in and this is what we're going to find out too. Is hey, these guys weren't drafted by the Vikings' current front office and coaching staff, so they don't have any emotional attachment or ego attachment like Rick Spielman might have to some of these guys. You know. This also, I I think that this is a a in. A, if this was to be compared to the restaurant business, I think Quasi and O'Connell are preparing us for a soft launch here. Um, <laughs> you if mean this a competitive soft, a competitive rebuild launch. or no? If <laughs> this does, no launch. because if be, because there's an underlying current, and I don't mind this. In in fact, it's very Zolganian. There's an underlying current in this camp of. These thing, these players are chips, and they are, but they're chips, you know. And they did keep in their in their um, attempt to win immediately. They kept a lot of veterans mm-hmm. and a lot of very familiar pieces. But if this does not work, I'm getting the idea that next uh, that next spring and summer could be a bloodbath. Because like yeah, look at yeah, no, true. like look at what they're doing and, and and again I'm not criticizing this whatsoever but if you look at what they're doing to the back end of the roster and Spielman's guys especially you know if this team underachieves I think you're looking at a lot of veterans i.e. the you know Harrison Smith potentially Kendricks's guys like that being gone and just gone fairly quickly total guess there. Well, and yeah, I mean, we'll we'll start to find out in a week from Sunday against the Packers. I want to point out one other thing. I think if it wasn't obvious sort of in our in our conversation about stocks and buying low, I think Jalen Rager has a much better chance to become whatever the best version of Jalen Rager is with the Vikings than he did with the Eagles. Mm, you know, Jalen Hurts is a talented, interesting quarterback, but he's not very accurate. He's not like a pinpoint get you get you the ball in the right spot for yards after the catch quarterback that Kirk Cousins is, you know. Especially first read, <clears throat> excuse me. Kirk Cousins is one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the league when it's just bam, drop back, bam, bam, get the ball out. He's going to get you yards after the catch. So from, from from that perspective, just leveraging speed and having an accurate quarterback that can put the ball where it needs to be. Jalen Rager has a better chance with Cousins than he did with with Jalen Hurts. Um, I'm not blaming the quarterback play on Jalen Rager's failures. It goes way beyond quarterback play. But the other thing, too, is the Vikings historically, recently and just over the decades of history, have been great at developing and maximizing wide receivers. Justin Jefferson didn't have to develop into what he has become. I mean, are there other organizations and other situations where he would... I don't think he would have been a bust if he would have been drafted by some crappy team like the Jaguars, but... I think he is becoming one of the best receivers in the NFL 
85% because he's Justin Jefferson, but 15% because he's got Keenan McCardell as a position coach. You know, he's got Adam Thielen as a tag team partner talking shop on the sidelines. Adam Thielen was developed from this Division II undrafted special teams player to becoming one of the best receivers in the NFL. Stefan Diggs went from being a fifth-round pick with some talent, like, time after time after time. K.J. Osborne developed into a 700-yard number three receiver last year. So does that mean that Jalen Rager is for sure going to become, oh, my God, now he's finally this 1,000-yard receiver that people thought he was going to be? No, but I think he has a better chance as a stock to shoot up to the right than he did with Philadelphia. I think the pressure of being gone from that team and that city helps too. Like that is a if you if you struggle that I mean I cannot if if you have not gone to a game there or seen that fan base I cannot articulate the brutality of that place. Uh, so I agree completely. I think he's got a far better chance in the Midwest with this team to succeed. The fact that he's had basically a career long problem of catching the ball tempers my expectation a bit but that's fine again you didn't trade in my opinion you didn't trade much it's worth a shot why not like like this is exactly the type of gambles that football teams should take unless you just watch this guy and said he's awful why not yeah and i think jefferson will help him I, I, i really do what i would say to a jalen rager is uh cheers to a change of scenery here's your first surly now that you're in the state of minnesota and Jalen, there's there is no pressure here, zero pressure. I mean, you come in here, you have fun. Just remember one thing: we're all trying to win a Super Bowl here in this damn town before we die. Exactly right. And and Surly has encapsulated that perfectly in their new beer. And so Jalen, no pressure. We just want a Lombardi Trophy, and you will be reminded of this each Sunday that you play a home game at U.S. Bank Stadium because. Before I die, available in that very can uh, th- throughout. And Jalen, if now you're saying, you know what, Judd, I, I I appreciate the welcome, but I would like you to dial down that pressure. I'm going to say, okay, start furious, logic bomb, supreme. I mean, there are other options before you, you actually w- work up to the before I die. Just make sure that if you like to con- consume beer, and who doesn't, that it is Surly Brewing. Uh, shout out to our friends also at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. They have been helping businesses as if they are a great offensive line with risk management tools, resources, protecting against risks on the horizon for over 100 years. And uh, you can find out more about the tools and the expertise and the people that they can bring to your business if you just go to federatedinsurance.com. There's also a full list of industries that they specialize in and see if your business matches up with that list federatedinsurance.com where it's our business to protect yours what are people saying about the minnesota vikings this is interesting from sportsillustrated.com si.com they have their projected standings the writer here is uh, gary gramling and this is specifically an nfc north preview section of the the overall nfl projections and standings so he, ha- and he, so he has record projections and then a write-up for every team here. He's got the Packers finishing first, 11-6. and six. Hmm. Okay. Just ahead of the 9-8 and eight Detroit Lions, who are ahead of the 7-10 and 10 Minnesota Vikings. Mm. And he's got a best-case and a worst-case write-up. The best case for the Vikings, he says, the Sean McVay coaching tree does it again as Kevin O'Connell coaxes a stunning season out of Kirk Cousins while Jefferson wins Offensive Player of the Year honors. Thanks to a smoke and mirrors defense, the Vikings get to 10 wins and the playoffs. But that's the best-case scenario. I think the best-case scenario is more than 10 wins for this team. But uh, The worst-case scenario, he says, Cousins is no Matthew Stafford, and it shows as O'Connell's offense remains middling Meanwhile, a secondary that's one part too old and one part too young struggles, particularly without Zimmer there to coach it up. Minnesota Dude. finishes 2022 <laughs> thinking rebuild. Oh, uh, I was all on board until that Zim part. Um, that's uh, yeah, I, I don't agree with that part. Um, well, he yeah. was great at coaching secondaries when he first got here. Oh, he was fantastic. Sure, right? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Keep in mind, 
Cam Dantzler inactive week one against the Bengals last year, so Bashad Breeland can play. That's a mistake. Yeah. Uh, the offensive thing, I think, is spot on. It's spot on because of one thing. Justin Jefferson cannot throw himself the football. So, like, he's right about that. Oh, but like Kirk that's threw where, it to him for 1,400 yards last season. So. But I. But the point is, can they take that next step where, where he becomes one? Like, if he is to be what he desires, which is the best receiver in the National Football League, it's going to have to, to take a definite step. And I think that step is 1,000% there. But I think that's a very fair assessment of, you know, what Kirk Cousins do we now see? And I'm telling you right now, I don't think we know. We don't know yet. Yep. The one that I don't want to see is the one that only targeted Justin Jefferson. I think it was nine total times between the Dallas and the Baltimore game. So heart of your season, you're battling for playoff position. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and def- defenses by then were pretty keen to what Jefferson was capable of. And, and the Vikings allowed defenses to take Justin Jefferson out. And I think that's something that Kevin O'Connell has come in. And, and look at what, I mean, it's not like defenses weren't trying to take Cooper Cup out of games. And they still said, oh. That's cute. We're still going to throw the ball 14 times to Cooper Cup every single game. So that'll be the most interesting chess match. Defense is trying to take Jefferson away. Yep. Kevin O'Connell and Kirk Cousins finding ways to still get him the football and targets. And, and the one thing that Kirk is going to have to do consistently, and I think he struggles with this because in, in his mind it's a risk, but in reality it's necessary. The one thing is, because Kirk is accurate and Kirk has a good arm, Um but where do the best quarterbacks have something on Kirk lots of times? A guy like Rodgers is a master at putting the football where the receiver is going to be and trusting he'll be there. If he's not, it's a problem. But, you know, Kirk, I feel like there's lots of times that things break down that or start to break down that Kirk wants to see, and, and it's why he goes to the check down. He wants to know that the pass can be completed. He doesn't like to take that risk. I feel like Jefferson, if he's going to be absolutely maximized, and he's been great, but if you're just going to take that next step, I feel like you're going to make throws that you feel are are a gamble, but in reality, because he's JJ, they're not. And, and Phil, I think we talked about this a couple months back, but it's very telling of Kirk, and I'm actually surprised now, in retrospect, he said it. But that the Packers game at uh, U.S. Bank Stadium last year, where I think he threw Jefferson a touchdown pass, and it was a hell of a play. It was a mm-hmm. really nice play. And Kirk flat out said, yeah, I probably shouldn't have thrown that ball. It's like, no, you need to throw that ball. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's on Kirk. Like, like there is a certain point, I think, that Kevin O'Connell can help Kirk a lot. But at some point in time, too, this is going to have to be on Kirk and Kirk's brain to say, okay, th- this seems like a lot of risk, but who am I throwing to? And I'm good, and am I good enough to make the throw? And the answer to the second part of the question is yes, you are. You just have to trust it. Yep. And, and I think Kirk kind of laid it out during one of the, I think it was after the mandatory mini camp when he was talking to the media, or maybe it was like first week of training camp. And he said something along the lines of, "I'm just trying to figure out what this coaching staff wants from me." Like he, I am, I am a puppet. That's one of the things yep. that drives me nuts about him. Is like, dude, be a leader and take ownership. It's not. He, ta- he talks like he's a second-year cornerback. I just want to know what the coaches want from me. It's like, well, dude, you're a, you're a co-owner of this offense. Right. You're one of the highest-paid quarterbacks in the NFL. Um, but if if the coaching staff led by Kevin O'Connell can tell him, hey, okay, here's what we want from you. Don't be as afraid to take some risks here and there. And I think sometimes I've, I've seen, you know, on Feedback Friday and just going through YouTube comments and stuff, people think that we want him to throw more interceptions. No, 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 no. We want him to be more aggressive when it makes sense. And if the result is a few more interceptions on the low end, but more chunk plays, touchdowns, productivity, fourth quarter comebacks, whatever on the high end, you can live with whatever the negative is over here because it's a net positive. I mean, Matthew Stafford had 17 picks last year, but the overall totality of the system and the aggressiveness and everything was net, 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 net positive. Right statistically and in terms of hoisting a Lombardi trophy at the end of the year, right? Yep, and, and if Stafford threw those picks on irresponsible, dumb passes to fullbacks, shame on him. If it was to Cooper Cup, I'd take that chance again. Yep. So um, so that, that's what people are saying about the Vikings on Sports Illustrated. They, they're trashing the Vikings. They're slandering the Vikings, saying that they're going to be entering a rebuild in 2023. Um, 
Boys, it's time once again to pit Judd against either me or Declan in the random Viking of the Week competition. Declan and I have now teamed up because Judd has become such a juggernaut in this game. I'm excited for this. And uh, I, uh, I'm on the hot seat against Judd this week in our random Viking of the Week. Yeah. So he, he, here's how this works. Oh. Declan's going to throw out a series of clues. And Judd and I each get up to three incorrect answers. We can just blurt out answers whenever we want to. If one of us gets to three, then the other one just wins automatically. That has not happened yet, I don't think. Almost happened once. Uh, and then we can ask Declan questions, but he can refuse to answer if he wants because he's the captain. I'm the captain. Now. Judd won last week by correctly guessing Jerome Simpson. The week before, uh, I correctly guessed Travis Taylor. The week before that, Judd won with Moritz Boehringer, and I won with Andre Allison the week before that. No more wide receivers for now. I think we should keep the wide receiver train going. Know. I'm 2-0 oh against yeah, you, you never wide know. receivers. I can't just wide eliminate receiver, a position yep. group. I can't Let's... just do that for Random Viking of the Week. I can't just do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of good oh. random wide. We just we threw maybe out some random you, wide receiver Maybe one day you can the run the Random of the Viking Week. You know, we'll let you not do the wide receivers. but uh, Maybe next know. week. Maybe, maybe. I can run it. It's true. All right, and then, and then all Declan and I have to do is we team up two on O, and if we can just get it before we guess incorrectly three times, then we get the point. <laughs> oh, I don't like that idea. No. By the way, Judd leads thing. thirty-two to seventeen all time in random Viking of the week. All right, let's go for thirty-three. All right, all right. Uh, this random Viking of the week played college football in the Mountain West. Uh, this random Viking of the week, his wife uh, almost made the Olympics as a sprinter. But she failed in the trials. She made the 2004 Olympic trials, but did not uh, did not get on U Team USA. This random bike of the week had, in my money, one of the most unusual paths to the NFL. Um, I gotta get my buzzer up. Wow. Do you have a guess already? I'm I'm trying. To, I do have a guess. All right. I'm trying to remember exactly what his name was. I'm uh, I'm gonna guess, right now. Okay. He's gonna okay. guess what I'm gonna guess. Three in. I'm gonna guess Jeff Dugan. Oh, he's already been. Not John you you, are, you already got Jeff Dugan correct early in the. Yeah, but I don't know what to expect now with Declan. If if mm -hmm. he's got the list, like there's a lot of there's a lot of questions here. Uh, I I don't remember this guy's name. But uh, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna. Get, I think I might need some help with the name here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this isn't how the game works. Who was that wide receiver sprinter guy that had the unusual path to the? He didn't actually play in a game. Was it? Is it like Todd Lober? Is that an official guess? Yeah. Do you remember that guy? Yes. Was yes. it Todd he, Lober? He was. Yes. And and he <laughs> was a. But he was a sprinter. Like I don't think his wife was. I just assumed that they were both very fast. I don't they even know if he was married. He was young. He was very, very cocky for a guy who was not good at football, as I recall. All right. I thought they would just be racing each other around the house. <laughs> good him and his wife. That's a lot. Of, that's a fun. This random Viking of the week had 15 touchdowns in college. 15 touchdowns in college, this random Viking of the week. Okay, so we both have one run. Okay. This random Viking of the Week was a UDFA. Wasn't drafted. This random Viking of the Week, in my money, was robbed of a Pro Bowl season and potentially an All-Pro season with the Vikings. Was robbed? Robbed. That's a very nebulous. Uh, robbed. Led the uh, NFL in a very major statistic and did not make the Pro Bowl or even an All-Pro selection. I should say probably like those. This random Viking of the week played for these coaches, Romeo Cornell, Cornell, Jack Del Rio, Denny Green, Mike Holmgren, and Mike Tice. Oh my God. This random Viking of the week. Can you slow down? Sure. <laughs> I got a lot of other stuff. So here, Romeo, yeah. so Romeo Cornell. So we, so so the, these are all head coaches. That so he, he played for Cornell. They were and, the head coaches that he played. Like they were the head either coaches. Cleveland or Houston. Um. <clears throat> okay, I have another guess. 
Okay. Lance Johnstone. Dang Negative. That's a, hold on a second. So he played for Holmgren. Can you tell us where he played for Holmgren? Which team? No. <laughs> he, so doesn't want to. he doesn't want C to. He doesn't Cialer, want to tell us that. Cialer. This random Viking of the Week was part of an infamous play that eventually led to an NFL rule change. Another Mike Holmgren clue for you, Judd. Mike Holmgren called this player the quarterback of the defense. This random Viking of the week picked off Brett Favre in the playoffs. Um, I have I do have another guess, but it's your last. One. I mean, obviously, it's my last one, so I'm trying to decide if I want to so, rifle it off or have Judd. So he picked off Brett Favre. Um, I'll take another. Okay. Oh wait, wait, wait! No, no, no! That's not the right one. A no. lot of guys picked off Brett Favre in the playoffs. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no! He did and it I was with the Vikings. The wrong game. He did it with I, the Vikings. I was thinking of the wrong game. So it would have been. So he played for. He played for Denny Green and Tice. You said right. Mm -hmm. I got yep. two. I got. I think it's one of two people, and I'm struggling with whether so, I should let Judd hang himself or not. I think I know the. I, I'm pretty sure I know the playoff game you're talking about. In fact, I, I know I know the playoff game you're talking about. All right, this I'm gonna go. Okay, okay. No, go, go, go. give us one more. I was gonna say this. This random Viking of the week switched positions from quarterback to the defensive side of the ball. He was a quarterback in college. In college. Okay. Very I'm gonna go athlete. for it. Okay. I'm gonna take destiny into my own hands. Okay. Quarterback in college. Is it Kylie Wong? Congrats, Judd. Judd wins by default, but we'll see if um, Judd can get it here. See if Judd wait, wait. So, so. All right, that playoff game was the 2004 season. It was January 2005. If I'm not mistaken. At Lambeau Field, the Vikings upset the Packers. Um, I'm trying to think of who had picks in that playoff game. Oh, Kylie Long was a second round pick. <laughs> yeah. I should know that. Oh, dang it! I'm trying to think of who had the picks in that. Uh, in that playoff game. I want to say Winfield had one, and obviously that's not it. He was not a... Mouse Random mouse. Viking of the Week played in 34 games. Excuse me, 48 games for the Vikings. 48 games for the Vikings. Started 34. He was on the other side of the Nate Poole reception. Yeah, that's... He's the... He was the push-out. Right? Yep. Or the... Or, he pushed out Nate Poole. He pushed out Nate Poole. Um... In that Cardinals game, yeah, because I I thought that was the the rule change, but I'm trying, but I I was not at that game. I was covering the Packers Denver game that that day. I'm trying to remember who who it was. Well, I won, right? You won. He, he oh. had nine interceptions in 2003. Led oh, the NFL in interceptions. I got it now. 95 tackles that year. Really good year. I, I don't know. I didn't make the Pro Bowl. Was it Chavis? You're close. You're really close. Wow. <clears throat> I mean, you won. You won, so. Mm -hmm. It's Brian Russell. Oh, Brian, Brian Russell. Russell. It's Brian Russell. Ah. Wow. Totally forgot about that guy. He was a good player for a couple he years. He actually did pick up Favre um, once or twice in the in the reopening day of Lambeau Field in 03, too. Okay. Yeah, Brian Russell, man. Yeah, he had nine interceptions in 2003. What, so what rule change was he part of? The push, the push up. Up. Is that, what that so they changed that rule because of that play? So like five, but like five years later. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. All right. Well, congrats, Judge. First time yeah. that's happened. First you're, time you're that's happened. Door, I, listen, I'm. I'm not just gonna sit back, man. I'm. Gonna, I'm not gonna let Judd dominate here. No, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw my elbows around. I'm gonna foul out if needed to show my presence in the paint, and it didn't I'm work. Get you off the scent. It was offense. Yeah. It was defense. Way to go. Yeah. yeah.
I did uh, not realize Judd, he why, why don't you celebrate by telling the audience how they can lose a bunch of weight if they if they so choose? <laughs> Well, and and guess what? Like, this is the one thing that I did not luck into, okay? So this is not a, you know, Phil guessed three times wrong, and now all of a sudden Judd is down 40 pounds. Uh-uh-uh. Thanks to my friends at Livia Weight Control Centers, I have dropped 40 pounds. And here's the best part. I'm keeping that weight off. Dawn looked at me and it's like, you've lost all this weight. I should join too. She joined down 16 pounds. In other words, this works. And here's the best part. It's not a diet. It's weight control. It's all about the dietitians helping you set a plan, execute that plan, and then stay on th that plan. And right now, it is their anniversary sale. Uh, you could join the program 50% off, 855-GO-LIVIA, L-I-V-E-A, Livia.com is where the weight loss starts. Feel great for fall, winter, fit into all of those clothes. How do you do it? Livia.com, 50% off right now. All right, that's a wrap on today's episode of Purple Daily, Daily Vikings Entertainment. Back at you tomorrow.